Okay, so I'm here to talk about open source with open gear. Um, we're a small Brisbane company and we build console servers at the moment. And uh, I want to talk about a, a little bit about me. So I'm the software manager at Open Gear. Um, we're based in Tawong. Majority of engineering's in, uh, in Tawong with us. We've got one guy in the US. For that, I work for Snapgear, which is a related company to Open Gear, building routers and firewalls, and for Canon down in Sydney. So I'm going to copy, go through a couple of topics today. So first off, uh, I want to talk about open source hardware. Um, back in 2005, Open Gear actually tried to start the company by building an open source hardware product. So I want to talk a little bit about, about open source hardware, the business models behind it, our open source hardware platform, uh, why it didn't work, um, pivot to current products, and then a little bit about how we use open source software. And hopefully it's going to be a bit of a different perspective to you guys since we're an embedded hardware vendor. So uh, it's very different from... Uh, from web services or middleware. Okay, so open source hardware, what does it mean? Well, it's any piece of hardware. It could be a Raspberry Pi, it could be uh, a computing platform, or it could be a table. There's no reason that it has to be electronic, but that's really what I'm gonna focus on. But for electronic projects, open source hardware to me means you should have, for every component on the board or component that makes up the, um, the project, you should have unrestricted data sheets that should allow you to design something using that component or write software for something using that component. You should get schematics and also Gerbers. Now, Gerbers are the actual PCB layout that you actually use to manufacture the, the board. So schematics are great and they're certainly necessary, but you won't be able to actually build the product unless you have the Gerbers. And it shouldn't need, or it should have very minimal, secret firmware blobs to actually function. So um, a lot of the open source projects we do have, I mean, a lot of the system on chips and stuff that people use these days do have these firmware blobs. Sometimes they're unavoidable. Sometimes they're actually in the ROM on the chip, and that's what they use to do their initial boot. Other times it's needed to start the video processor. But as long as people are working towards minimizing that, then that's a good thing. And once you've got your, pro your product, everything's looking great, you need to license it somehow. So you can license it a number of ways. Um, a lot of people use Creative Commons. There are special hardware licenses, so the TAPR open hardware license. And then other people, again, uh, use uh, repurposed software licenses like your three clause BSD or LGPL. Okay, so I've got a couple of popular open source projects, open source hardware projects here. So we've got Raspberry Pi, everyone's familiar with. The Beagle Board and Beagle Bone, um, they were used in yesterday's robotics presentation. Arduino was used everywhere, but also in yesterday's robotics presentation. And also RepRap. RepRap's a bit different. It was the first uh, open source project for um, 3D printers, for the 3D printers that squirt plastic out to actually build the model that way. So there are business models behind all of these. So Raspberry Pi, they're a not-for-profit foundation, and the goal is to advance computing education and understanding. So they wanted little computers they could build to put in classrooms, and so kids could learn, uh, and so everyone would be familiar with them. Now, to actually make money that they push all of it straight back into that foundation to keep doing this, they outsource their manufacturer and sales to third party. So they've got two companies, Farnell and RS Components, and they, they do all of the uh, distribution and manufacture, and they charge a royalty per unit shipped. Um, sorry, Raspberry Pi, the foundation, charge a royalty per unit shipped, which goes back to the foundation to keep development. The Beagle Board and Beagle Bone are, are a similar setup. Both their founders are TI employees. Um, TI are, are very graciously let them work on that as part of some outreach from TI. None of these are supposed to make heaps of money and, and you know, make anyone filthy rich. They're both foundations at the core. But this is how the money is generated from these open source hardware platforms back to the guys who did the design. You've got other business models. So you've got manufacturer outreach. So these are products that exist to encourage interest in a particular system on chip. So things like, if, I don't know if anybody rem remembers plug computers. They were a big thing a couple of years ago. Um, a lot of people tried them and went, eh, it doesn't really do what I want to do. But for Marvell, which are the guys behind the plug computer, it got lots of people interested in using their Kirkwood chips. Um, so you've got other things like the Guru plug, which is a, a slightly different version of that in the mirror box. And now you've got even getting cheap development boards by, so the, the Jetson TK1 is NVIDIA's latest development board for their Tegra K1 processor. And they've started selling that at all sorts of even little computer shops online. The idea then, they're trying to get people interested in building CUDA applications to run on ARM. Um, but it built, it's designed to get people using their chips. And the third model I want to talk about is branding. So we've got Arduino is a good example of people who make their money from, from branding and licensing. So they do, they're all the designs and software are free and open source. Uh, they manufacture official boards and they've got no problem with anyone else building boards as long as they don't call them Arduinos. They've got to call them, they, it's compatible with the Arduino or, or something like that. 
they also derive their income from consulting. So when Intel, for example, go, hey, we want to have Arduino support on our little Galileo small board computers and stuff, they come to the Arduino guys and say, here, will you help us do this? And then you've got RepRap and MakerBot. So RepRap, as I said earlier, was the first, uh, th was one of the first open source projects for these um, 3D printers that, that uh, the fused deposit modeling they're called. Now, MakerBot was started by one of the co-founders of the RepRap project, and they existed as a little sort of service company on the side. So they sold kits and components that were all open source hardware. And they kept doing that, they got some funding, and eventually Stratus, as one of the big players in the 3D printing space, got very worried and decided that they better own some of this. And they ended up buying Stratus, uh, buying MakerBot, which was a small company initially, for $403 million. So when OpenGear did their own open hardware project, they were hoping to be another MakerBot. So, Open Gears, open hardware project. It was called OKVM. So it was back in 2005 too. So the computing landscape was a little bit different. Back then, uh, and you still have them now, but they're not as popular, uh, lots of data centers had things called KVMs, which stands for keyboard video mouse. Uh, and they basically plug into the hardware. They plug into what was then the VGA socket and the PS2 sockets for your keyboard and mouse. And they export that and let you interact with that over an IP network. Um, and what's true then is still true now. They're expensive. So a single port, so a single concurrent user, but 32 port KVM, so 32 different machines, for almost four and a half thousand dollars now, and they were more expensive back then. Um, the way you access them is completely proprietary. Uh, there's a Java app, they certainly don't give you the source to, and the, the protocols that they use are proprietary for each different manufacturer. So what you do is you get a bunch of vendor lock-in. So if you've got one data center using these KVMs, you're going to use them everywhere because you only have to train your technicians to use one set of KVM applications. And uh, you've probably got your rest of your ecosystem all tied to sort of interacting with these one things. So what OpenGear tried to do was the secret source in this is the, is the video capture. That's the hard bit that people didn't really know how to do. So they wanted to disrupt that to commoditize the video capture part. So they built a PCI card. So they built a PCI card that was supposed to go in commodity servers so people could build their own KVM boxes. So it had a video capture and encoding IC on it. It had, uh, and what that, the way that worked is that captured the video signals and put it through to some RAM. And then the, uh, the PC had a Linux driver that could go and read that RAM and, and bring that out. And you could use, do that, you could sort of export that to the network any way you liked. So we did VNC. Um, we had a, a microcontroller on board that emulated the keyboard and mouse. Um, and so it worked quite well. These days it'd be more complex because you'd have to emulate USB and a bunch of different things. You'd have to deal with HDMI and the display port and all that sort of stuff. Uh, so we released schematics, Gerbers, a bill of materials, bundled source code for all the code that was running on the, on the board and also on the PC. Uh, an embedded Linux distribution that, ex that, that had a little web configuration UI and exposed the KVM via VNC. The idea was we'd sell these cards at cost. Third parties would build solutions around them. Third parties would start building their own cards into appliances and everyone would be happy. And we'd have an open access sort of manner for doing this and the existing players would either have to join in or get left behind. But it didn't work. Um, and there are a number of reasons. So right from the get-go, we ran into problems with the hardware vendors. Um, vendors wanted NDAs for their data sheets. They didn't want just anybody to, to simply have the temerity to download the data sheet from the website and see how these things worked inter internally. Uh, and that's still a problem these days. More and more vendors are understanding that, you know, uh, if people are going to use your, your gear, they want to have access so they can evaluate. They don't necessarily sign their, way, sign their life away every time people want to uh, see things. Um, and then, given that OpenGear didn't want to build these things forever, it was hard to find limited small volume manufacturers. So SparkFun or Seed Studio, these guys who build, you know, extra little boards for, black, for Beagle boards and Arduinos and stuff, they didn't exist then. Uh, you couldn't even have the online PCB fabrication houses. They didn't exist then either. It was, if you want to get a PCB made, you had to do a big order and you had to do it in a very old-fashioned way. And KVM itself was sort of getting, heading towards end of life. So management processes on your servers were embedding that functionality. Uh, often badly, uh, you have to pay more for it. And even still these days, if anyone's used that sort of stuff, uh, they've all got their own little interface for doing it. Uh, Intel have actually started a, a project called the KVM Gateway, and the whole point of it is that they want to provide a central point of access for all these particular buses, but of course they want to charge for it. But the core issue was we were targeting the wrong type of customers. Um, KVM's for fixing problems. They want something that's reliable, they want someone they can yell at if it's not working, so they want support, and they want warranty replacement. So cost, which is one of the arguments we were putting forward, wasn't compelling 
for them because if it didn't work, they'd have to send a technician out and that's expensive. So we were very lucky to actually get a second chance at a product because so, we spent our first round of seed funding on this. So what we did is we pivoted to console servers, which were proprietary hardware, mostly open software. We focused on serial, not KVM, so we had a much bigger market to, to attack. And we learnt the lessons of the KVM manufacturers and what we were trying to disrupt there was we tried to be vendor agnostic, so support everyone. Um, and to provide reliability, support, and the warranty required by customers. So that's a little bit of a history about open source hardware then, uh, what, what we tried to do. And, and I don't necessarily think it would still work these days, um, even though a lot of things are easier. It's easier to get data sheets. It's easier to find manufacturers and things like that. I still think that the crux of it is, if it's something that people are going to use in emergencies, they want something to yell at. It sort of goes back to the, the previous talk where uh, companies are risk averse. They want to be able to sue, something, sue someone if something goes wrong. So you really need to have that sort of structure behind it. So at OpenGear, we build little embedded ARM computers. So our firmware is based on UC Linux Dist, which is an old distribution that uh, came out of the whole UC LibC project, which was a, a small LibC for embedded computers. Um, it's working fine for now. It was a historical choice. We're considering the moving to Yocto, which is a big one, a big one that's sort of Wind River and Intel and co are behind. The console servers use ARM CPUs, ARM 9s and Cortex-A8s. We've got a management platform, which is x86-64. Um, they use UC libc and glibc. They use kernels 3.4 and 3.10, and they're using Ubud as their bootloader. So we don't, we, uh, our, our, the very core of what we do is proprietary at this stage. Um, we really, everything else is um, just stock open source software. We do so, source dumps by email, and I know that's a really old fashioned way of doing it, but I've only had one request in four years. If I start getting more requests, I'm really happy to, to put it up and push it to a GitHub or something like that. One of the reasons for that is that we, we do a developer kit which lets people build their own firmware images. So maybe that ticks all the boxes for the people who actually want the firmware. So we do have proprietary software on board. <laughs> Boo hiss. Um, so our core components, which is our config and CGI system, which are quite frankly old and crafty, you, you don't want. Um, our serial port management, which uh, I guess the management is still worried about releasing. I, I have no problems with it, but, but they're scared. Um, and components that we want to replace are open source. So we've got our cellular modem control. Uh, we integrate cellular modems in some of our products. And that's difficult due to vendor NDAs. So we use these Sierra wireless um, cellular modems. And, and they do have support in mainline Linux, but the CDMA versions, you can't have a data connection and send SMSs at the same time unless you're using the special Sierra wireless <coughs> API. And the Red Hat guys have done a lot of really good work reverse engineering that, but it's not there yet. They don't have everything, and so we're hamstrung. So we can't switch across to using something like Modem Manager or something smaller. And our network interface control. Uh, and we might be a bit naive here, but we don't think that uh, things like Network Manager and stuff like that can actually model the network dependencies that we want. The other problem we have is that projects from mainline don't take embedded into account. Um, our slower shipping device has got 32 megs of RAM and 16 megs of flash. That's it. We've got to fit an entire Linux system in that and run in that. So Dbus, Systemd, Motor Manager, Net Manager, they don't fit and they don't fit, they aren't fit for purpose for us. So OpenWIT have been really good um, providing alternatives that we're investigating, but these will need a fair bit of customization for our use cases. Okay, now, sorry, this is a bit of a bits of presentation. I'm going to change again. One of the things that I did want to talk about was how our changing customer sets have changed how we've used open source and how we've presented our use of open source to the customers, which I think ties in quite nicely to the previous presentation. So our initial customers were Unix sysadmins. And so when we gave them a Unix, a Linux computer, they said, hey, this is great. So it had Bash on board so they could script. If we didn't do exactly what they wanted, they could write a script to do what they wanted. We added more features via open source projects. Um, um, there's a list there. Most of those sysadmins, if they were doing that stuff already, were using the same projects. So we integrated with their existing infrastructure easily. And so open source packages on board was a selling point. We started to get some larger companies, customers, so enterprise. And suddenly, a lot of the problems, again, in the, in the previous thing are coming up. So scripting, not acceptable. It has to be entirely configured via a particular assigned way. We shouldn't have to change any, you shouldn't have to write scripts at all. So, okay, we rewrote that functionality to make it more complete. And now the poor customers who had written scripts before, our stuff trumps over the top of that. So we had a bunch of issues there. And they're really indifferent to open source software, generally because they're not using it. They, they might be using it for small little projects, but they'll have structureware or some big players for their monitoring systems that you're going to have to write software and write a way to interact with that anyway. So we were finding that the feature set, we said, hey, we can do all these things. That wasn't as important as the actual 
core usability of that feature set. So we're transitioning towards that well, but it would have been easier if we'd got it done it right from the beginning. I mean, I don't think that's a lesson for small companies hoping to become large. And everyone says in the startup world that you're supposed to just ship, get your stuff out and just ship it and then you can fix it later. That's true, but you're really just deferring a lot of technical debt till later. Uh, the other sort of change is management, so large deployments. Um, again, we've got to try and fit into their, their, trying to fit into their existing architectures, so we ended up adding a REST API. Uh, as I said, a lot of the management stuff is actually accepting REST as both for data input and output these days. So really the transition for us as a company has been from base, being based on purely open source, so trying to do this open source hardware play and have everything out in the open, to still used to moving open source, but moving to vendor neutrality, so open APIs. And I think that's, for most of the hardware players, that's the way things are going these days. What can we do better? Lots. There's a couple of other things. And, and if anyone's a customer, I'd really like to know what we can do better. But uh, we need to do better at pushing our changes upstream. We don't have, I mean, most of our changes are actually to the Linux kernel. So we've got a bunch of modifications for our, for our board support that need to get pushed back. Sometimes that hard. Um, for an example, the latest thing we've built uses, uh, is on kernel 3.10, so it's ARM, so it uses device trees. And that's great, but our watchdog chip needs to be initialized before the device tree is ready to be loaded. So you can't use device tree for that. Uh, things like that where, <coughs> uh, sorry, are particular decisions that, you know, hindsight would be, we'd probably design it differently if we wanted to make sure it was gonna fit straight into the Linux kernel. Uh, our previous decisions have kind of hamstrung us trying to get things upstream. Uh, we could do a better job of keeping packages up to date. So because we're using UC Linux Dist and we're one of the only users of it still, uh, the onus is on us completely to make sure all our packages are kept up to date. Uh, we to keep all our core, but some of the little user space utilities and things like that are a bit older. It's hard. It's a hard problem, um, particularly if you're a small company. So that's why I recommend going to something like Yocto, or if you're uh, doing an appliance, you can base it on, on Ubuntu or on a Fedora or something like that, and let those guys, let Upstream handle it. Uh, and I'd like to move more of our stack to being open source software. I mean, 95% 90, of it is, but I'd be much happier if it was only a little bit, or, or in, if the best thing would be for there to be none. Okay, so I kind of sped through that so everyone can get to lunch. Um, is there any questions on, on what, I've, what I've talked about? If you've got uh, that much openness, how, how much of a concern do you have with people just duplicating your design? And, and well, we don't. We don't really have that much concern with people duplicating designs because um, people will be duplicating that stuff. You, you, there is open source alternatives to our proprietary applications. So the serial port management, there's a project called Conserver, which is really good, um, which a lot of companies use, and they, they might have a bunch of things. Like a lot of our customers are still using Cisco routers with async serial cards to talk, talk to different things, and they'll use Conserver as their front end. Um, <coughs> it's not really a worry for us because most of our customers go, great, uh, I could build it myself, but then I, have to, I, want to, I want someone to sue and someone for warranty. The other thing is that uh, regulatory costs mean that any other company has to come in and there's still, because you're building hardware, there is still some upfront costs that they would have to go and deal with before they, before they tried to attack us really on, on the market. I can yell. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. does, does being open stop the Chinese copy? No, it doesn't. Um, Could you repeat that question, yes? Yeah, okay, the question was, does being open stop the Chinese copying? No, no, it doesn't at all. Um, so there's an example from a previous company, and, and, and Andrew in the front row might remember this one. Um, we, had, we were building a router, and uh, we built through a particular contract man manufacturer in China. Uh, and then they had another contract man manufacturer came to us and said, hey, look, we can build your product too, and gave us <laughs> one of the products. The day we built this. And it was the same metalwork. It had the same factory test Im image on it. It had the same PCB layout. And this is stuff that was all, you know, that we hadn't released. It was all supposed to be commercial and confidence. But that doesn't matter. It doesn't stop them. So really what, you, what you've got to do is you've just got to have enough value. So provide good support, provide good warranty, make sure your software's rock solid so that people don't have a reason to go, well, oh, I'm buying these things, but I'm a bit frustrated. Hey, there's a cheaper alternative, I'll use that. You, once you get a customer, you want to you keep them. Uh, and if you can demonstrate, say, oh, there's a cheaper one on the market, who's going to copy our stuff? And you go, well, yeah, but they don't do this, which is the, the better support and the warranty, and so on and so forth.
You mentioned that you haven't fed as much of your changes back upstream as you'd like. Is, is that a moral issue or would it have made your life easier if you'd done that as well as you know, being the polite thing to do? I think, well, it would have made, it's both. Uh, but honestly, it's, it would make our life easier if we had sort of thing. So, for example, one of the architectures that we use for our NMR CPUs isn't in mainline, it's an ARM, but that particular system on chip isn't supported by mainline. And it was chosen before I started, uh, <laughs> so I don't know if I would have chosen that one if I'd used it, if, I, if I'd had the choice before, before that. But if we'd made the effort with any other companies that were using that particular chip to get that in mainline, it would have saved a lot of effort for us. Every time we move to a new kernel, we've got a all the particular, you know, the setup interrupts, all that sort of stuff, we have to do again and, and port to new interfaces. So that would have saved us time. Um, other than that, uh, it's other than that, it's also sort of making our use case heard. As I said in earlier slides, lots of the software isn't designed for embedded. So if we can sort of push back and go, yeah, we've had to make these changes so this thing even runs on our on our box. If we had more people thinking that way, then that'd be a better thing for us as well. So I guess you're um, uh, maintaining your own distribution effectively. Yes. So you've got all these small open source packages. Yes. How do you keep up to date with uh, security fixes in all your packages? Do yeah, you so have somebody monitoring all the different packages? Yes, or? we do. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So usually, usually you get the security, the the vulnerability feeds come out. Unfortunately, we're too, we're small enough that we don't get early access to a lot of those vulnerabilities when they come out. So, and that's a hassle for us. So it's a scramble. Um, so shell shock was the latest one that that we had to fix because we use Bash. Uh, and we didn't get the early, early access for that. We managed to get firmware out in two days um, with, the, with, the, with the fixes, but that was hell. That was, that was really bad. If we'd been based on something like, well, I don't even know about Yocto, for example, um, one of the upstream distributions. I don't think they were that fast to actually push changes again because it's not just running a, an app get update on your system. For us, we've got to generate a new firmware file and people have to, we have to tell our customers, they have to download the firmware file and install it. So. Uh, definitely, it's a hassle. It takes a lot of our time, and that's again what I was saying. One of the primary reasons that we want to move across to Yocto. But the difference is, is that our devices are still quite small, even compared to the sort of devices they're targeting with that. So it'll be a hassle for us to try and get everything to fit still. So how, how many packages do you have? Lots. Um, <laughs> so <coughs> most of user space is actually BusyBox. So, but we do have. So when you talk about sort of the large package, we've got OpenSSL, obviously, um, and that's been a, a super fun time with security updates for that. Uh, we've got the kernel, the libc. We don't have to, UC libc is a smaller sort of target. It doesn't get as much people actively trying to find exploits in that. Um, and generally, because we've got a, a smaller attack surface than a lot of the other things, things we've got, you can attack us via SSL um, and, and the web UI, basically. So we've got all the web UI stuff to deal with. That's why the bash one was such a, such a nasty thing, because we use CGIs. Um, but SSH, we, we try and lock down the device as much as we can anyway. And so, so back to the number of packages. We've got BusyBox. We use Cherokee Web Server. We've got OpenVPN, free, OpenSwan for IPsec, uh, SSH, Telnet if customers really, really want to turn it on. Um, but a lot of these. Uh, you know, tell them it's it's really it's insecure, and we tell customers that if you want to turn it on, if you have to, don't put it on a private on a public network. So, yeah, so it, it's a it's a bunch of work for us, but something we have to do because of the choices we've made. Great, thanks. Yep. Okay. All right. Thanks very much.